methotrexate, a rheumatologist's favorite. We use methotrexate in almost every rheumatic autoimmune disease we care for. Whether it is in a big lecture hall or in clinic hallways, if two rheumatologists are talking about a case, you will definitely hear one of them ask, well, have you tried methotrexate? If you are being treated for conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, or even lupus, you may find yourself staring down a prescription for methotrexate. We're going to get into how it works, how we use it in rheumatology, and what some of the common side effects are and what you can expect when you're taking it. So let's get started. Methotrexate has a very long and, I think, interesting history. In the late 1940s, precursors to methotrexate were first used in children with leukemia and found to be very effective. These medications were folic acid antagonists, and it was theorized that by depriving tumor cells of folic acid, the tumor cells would then die, the tumors would shrink which is what happened. These initial versions then led to the development of methotrexate, and in 1951, the first report of use of it in rheumatoid arthritis was published. I think it's important to note that even then, there was debate regarding if and why something like methotrexate should be used in rheumatoid arthritis. Why would we use such a toxic medication for something that isn't cancer? I think this is particularly interesting because we are beginning to have similar discussions regarding the use of CAR T cell therapy in autoimmune conditions. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'll link the New England Journal paper that got lots of attention in the description box below. And let me know if you'd like me to dedicate a whole video discussing this. It's definitely something that will be coming to a rheumatologist's office near you if it hasn't already. But I digress. So how does methotrexate work? Well, we aren't 100% sure. Initially, it was thought to be similar to cancer. Methotrexate diminished inflammatory cells and protein production by denying them folic acid. However, new mechanisms involving enzymes not related to folic acid at all have been implicated and seem to be related to its anti-inflammatory effects. Now, why do we use it? Well, given its effectiveness, it has become standard of care in rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, and really any autoimmune condition that is driven by inflammatory arthritis. As I have often said, each of us with an autoimmune condition have our own personal flavor to that condition. If we have lupus, we may have lupus in our kidneys or our joints or both. If we have Sjogren's syndrome, we may deal with dry eyes and dry mouth only, or we may have joint pain and swelling similar to rheumatoid arthritis. Regardless of what your diagnosis may be, if one of the defining features of your flavor of diagnosis is inflammation in your joint, you can bet your rheumatologist has considered starting methotrexate. And why? Because we have study after study proving that it works to decrease inflammation, joint pain, and swelling. It is such a keystone element of rheumatology care that even when the new fancy biologics were being developed and studied, they were studied with methotrexate, which reminds me of a quote one of my former older colleagues said, which is, You'll have to pry it from my cold, dead paws. Which should show how much rheumatologists just love methotrexate. Now, rheumatologists know methotrexate inside and out. We know how much to use, how long to take it to make a difference, and of course, what side effects it can cause. As we figured out, we don't need nor want to use methotrexate in the high doses that are used for cancer. For autoimmune disease, we take methotrexate once a week. Each tablet is 2.5 milligrams, and you may be prescribed anything from 7.5 milligrams, which are three pills, to 25 milligrams, which will be 10 pills one time a week. You'll generally be advised to take all the pills together on the same day of the week. Methotrexate can also be taken as an injection. Our gut's ability to absorb methotrexate goes down as we get to the higher doses. And if we want to squeeze as much juice out of methotrexate before adding another medicine, we can switch from pills to a weekly injection. We use the same dosing when using the injections and we tend to get a little bit more bang for our buck with the injections. When we start methotrexate, we don't start at high doses. We start low 
and we work our way up. You may be given instructions to start at three or four tablets per week for a few weeks and then work your way up to six, seven, or eight tablets once a week. This allows your stomach to get used to it and increases your chances of being able to take it long term. When first starting methotrexate, we can get anxious to see effects right away, but we need to put on our patient pants because as effective as it is, it needs a little time. I will often advise patients that when trying methotrexate, we need to commit to at least three months to see if this thing is gonna help. And the clock doesn't start on the first dose, but on the first goal dose. So the weeks that we're using to titrate up to our goal dose, they don't count. Yes, I'm a little bit of a stickler and I have seen people start to feel better even after their first month when they're on low doses, of course. But if we are truly going to give this the old college try, then we need to make sure we took three months of the right dose. Hey there, so I'm just jumping on real quick to let you know about something I've built that will get you answers faster. Your appointment home run handbook. I developed this after over 15 years of seeing thousands of autoimmune patients. This totally free handbook will help you think through your symptoms, your past experiences, and your family history so that you can walk into your appointment ready to tell your story and walk out confident in your plan. The best results my patients have had is when we are on the same team, and this is what I want for you and your doctor, which is why I've made this handbook totally free. You can find the link to get your free copy of your appointment home run handbook in the description box below. I and my fellow doctors are only as good as the information we have, and 90% of that information comes from you, so make it count. So we gotta talk about the side effects. So the first inconvenient truth is that side effects on methotrexate are not particularly rare. With reports noting side effects in 30 to 80% of methotrexate users, and up to a third of those will actually need to stop the medicine because of those side effects. Many of the side effects, especially the less severe, but certainly still bothersome ones, can be prevented by taking a daily folic acid tablet. The most common side effect, and remember that means most common compared to some of the others, not that the majority of methotrexate users will get this, but is nausea. Stomach upset can certainly happen with methotrexate and is the main reason we start low and work our way up to the goal dose. People who start methotrexate with this approach have a much better chance of success than if they just go straight for the big dose. If your nausea just won't go away or you are miserable the entire week after your dose, we can switch someone from pills to injections. Another side effect to keep an eye out are mouth ulcers. The technical term is mucosal domatitis. This inflammation of the lining of our mouth can be as uncomfortable as it sounds. This tends to be problematic in those not taking folic acid with their methotrexate, and if very severe, can actually lead us to stop the medicine completely. Although stomach upset and mouth ulcers can happen at any time during someone's course with methotrexate, they tend to happen in the beginning when someone first starts the medicine. There are also a number of side effects that can happen more long-term or after longer use. The most common of these is hair thinning. It's very rare for someone to completely lose their hair like you would think with classic chemotherapy, but some hair thinning is unfortunately not uncommon. Decreasing the dose or taking a hair supplement can help with this. In fact, a good friend of mine from medical school happens to have an amazing hair supplement product that can help support hair growth for those with autoimmune disease or chemotherapy, and I'd recommend looking into it. It's called WellBell, and I'll put the link in the description box below. This is not sponsored or anything, and that link isn't even an affiliate link, but in full disclosure, he's a good friend of mine, and I use it. Other long-term side effects we look out for are liver inflammation, low cell count, or lung injury. So I know those things sound scary, but we have protocols to look for these and ways to deal with them. Methotrexate, like many other medications, supplements, or even foods, can cause liver inflammation. Well, when our liver also has to deal with other toxins like alcohol or fat, this can put us at higher risk for liver inflammation or failure. So what do I mean by this? Well, the liver, like a lot of things, can handle some inflammation and will then heal. But when exposed to too much inflammation for too long, that healing can result in scar tissue. When we're talking about the liver, scar tissue is called fibrosis or cirrhosis. And if the liver has too much scar tissue, then it can't do its job as well and thus we get liver failure. So, when needing to take methotrexate, we need to be careful to limit all other perpetrators of liver inflammation. 
so no drinking alcohol, and we need to do what we can to decrease the fat load within our liver. Because remember, fat in the liver is inflammatory. To make sure there isn't too much liver inflammation, we check blood work at least every three months for everyone on methotrexate. In that blood work, we test for signs of liver inflammation, but also liver function. If things are getting hairy, meaning we're seeing too much inflammation, we will either decrease the methotrexate dose or just stop it altogether. During these every three month blood tests, we are also checking your cell counts, meaning your white blood cells, your red blood cells, and your platelets. A drop in any of these lines may be related to methotrexate, and so we keep an eye on them. Detecting lung injury from methotrexate is gonna be largely based on symptoms. It's standard to have a chest x-ray done prior to starting the medicine, so we have a baseline to compare future x-rays to, but we won't necessarily repeat this unless you develop new symptoms like shortness of breath, chest pain, or cough. Now, this is not meant to scare you. We are still going to get colds, have allergies, and just get out of shape, which are much more common reasons to have those symptoms. But if you notice you are having persistent symptoms for weeks to months without any real clear explanation, definitely bring them up with your doctor. Methotrexate is as common as prednisone and NSAIDs in a rheumatologist's office. But just like with every medication, you need to go in with eyes wide open. Knowing what the medication does, why it's recommended you take it, what side effects to look out for, and how best to support yourself while taking it is key to finding success with it. I have done videos on the entire rheumatoid arthritis treatment strategy that I'll link down below so you can learn how rheumatologists think when approaching someone with RA and how methotrexate fits into that great bigger strategy. I hope you found this helpful. Please feel free to subscribe, like, and share. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.